his entire profile is extremely relevant, unfortunately for us. And tonight's talk even uh, even more so, uh, he will be presenting joint work with uh, Arda Gitmes, uh, The Dictator's uh, Dilemma, A Theory of Propaganda and Repression. Uh, Konstantin, we generally take some very brief clarification questions as we proceed and we leave uh, heavier discussions towards the end of, uh, of the talk, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect, screen is yours. Uh, okay, so do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me and thank you for supporting Ukraine and Kyiv, Kyiv School of Economics. I think there is more support that is needed, especially support from intellectuals. So I encourage every um, everyone who is an economist to keep speaking, uh, speaking up about what is going on about the need to support Ukraine and support the war or uh, the war effort until the Ukraine uh, until Ukraine wins, uh, basically because people will eventually get dead. People already get dead, especially in the in in the West. So it should be like a constant conscious effort to um, to support uh, to support the uh, support Ukraine's efforts. Okay, so this is a theoretical paper called The Dictator's, Dictator's Dilemma, A Theory of Propaganda and Repression. This is a joint work with Arda Gitmans from Bill Kent. And uh, the Dictator's Dilemma is a not well-defined thing. It's a thing that a lot of people mean different things when talking about um, the Dictator's Dilemma. I will talk about the dilemma that every dictator faces, whether to engage in repression, or to engage into information manipulation. I mean, these are two main tools um, tools uh, in the arsenal of any autocratic regimes. It was there 200, 2,000 years ago. It was there 1,000 years ago. Today, we see the most autocratic regimes in the world, the most autocratic regimes in Europe. They do mass repressions, they purge their citizens, they imprison citizens, they push citizens out of the country. Also, we, we see a lot of uh, information manipulation and persuasion and all kind of censorship uh, is going on. So the first thing to know is that propaganda has always been a central element of totalitarian dictatorships. This was well studied almost in a sort of a different term. So back 70 years ago, the people who were studying um, studying totalitarian dictatorships, were, they were speaking less about persuasion, they were speaking more about ideology. But basically, if we, uh, if we restate what they were writing in the modern term, we will get basically the same picture as we have today. Recently, there is a work, there is a great book by Sergei Grief and Dan Friesman, uh, that argues that today's dictator's propaganda is mostly about their level of competence rather than uh, some ideological ideological indoctrination. And one thing, one thing about this um, book by Grief and Trisman and other arguments is that uh, they argue in this book, in previous papers, that information is essentially a substitute uh, for brutal repression. So one argument goes that back 70 years ago, there were uh, totalitarian dictators, they were extremely cruel, they repressed people in mass. And now the dictators became so sophisticated that they actually manipulate information rather than, uh, rather than just repress, repress people. In fact, this idea that information is a substitute for brutal repression is very old. So back 500 years ago, the first classic of modern political economics, Niccolo Machiavelli was writing that it's basically a choice between repressions, which instill fear and propaganda, which makes you love uh, the dictator. So it was a substitute then. So our main contribution in this paper is that we identify a mechanism uh, through which propaganda is a complement to repression. And the basic intuition is actually quite straightforward. The basic intuition is that if you have heterogeneous attitudes 
um, toward the regime, toward the dictator in the society. And you could target your repressions, maybe imperfectly, but you could target your repressions. Then you could change the distribution of attitudes in the society. And once you've changed the distribution of attitude, your persuasion of those who remain who are not repressed becomes more effective. So as a result, you have a natural complementarity. When repressions are easier, the propaganda is more, uh, is more heavily, heavily used. And in, in, fact, in fact, one could see um, this thing going on right now in Russia or in Belarus like um, in the last three or two, two or three years, both governments, both Lukashenko's government and Putin's government, they had to escalate their repressions, right? So they had to actually jail hundreds of opponents. They had to arrest tens of thousands of people. They had to uh, introduce new, uh, new laws, they introduce um, long uh, jail terms for their for their opponents, and at the same time they basically increase the amount of propaganda propaganda they're using. In so fact, constantly, I have a very quick question here. So, when we frame the problem in terms of changes in distribution of attitudes, is this, uh, in a sense, that a, a larger share of the population is no no longer so easily persuaded by the manipulation? Or is it that you have a more radical component that fights back more actively? Okay, uh, we have the distribution of attitudes as given, right? So if you repress those who are the most vocal opponents, then you could basically feed more to the, um, to the remaining part. Okay, so in a sense you... The distribution of attitudes changes. It's not the attitudes of the people change. Of themselves. Okay, many... Many things. And then the other thing that, that was interesting, you said at some point, we sort of a, the modern dictators gave up on ideology and, and understood that they want to be seen as competent. So do we know what sort of motivates this or, or maybe they coexist? Why I, 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 would say, I would say that it's not, I would say that it's not about the dictators changing, um, switching from ideology towards persuasion that they're competent. It's in part the way we read what was going on, like we social scientists, okay. right? So when uh, when they were saying that Stalin is the best best scholar of all sciences, the genius it was in Russian, mm -hmm. the genius of all sciences, then uh, the scholars of the time they interpret this as in like ideology. So this is a kind of a worship, mm, right? Okay. Mm, but okay. Now we think about the same thing as a persuading that he is actually more competent. I don't know in managing sciences than other things. Understand. Thanks. Okay. So uh, our. Um, our model of information manipulation, I will start with information man manipulation, so first propaganda without repressions, then I will add repression. Uh, it's a Bayesian persuasion of agents with heterogeneous priors. I will say what, what distinguishes Bayesian persuasion from other models a little bit later. So importantly, there is a sender in our model, the leader, and there is a unit me measure of receivers who are citizens the state of the world is uh, zero or one. So one way to interpret this is that the leader is either competent or incompetent, and, and each citizen chooses the level of support for the leader, right? So basically the citizens, they want, uh, they want to match the state of the world. So if they think that the leader is competent, then they support him. If they think that the leader is incompetent, then they do not support him. So the, this in theoretical terms means that they want to match the state of the world. The leader's payoff is the amount of support that, um, that he or she, uh, she gets. Uh, actually, actually, in the paper, we call the leader she, although there historically have been very few, very few dictators. There were female dictators, but very, um, very few. So, uh, one difference from the basic model of propaganda as Bayesian persuasions is that citizens in our model have heterogeneous priors, 
meaning there is a fraction who have a high prayer that the leader is competent, and there is a fraction alpha that has a lower prayer that the leader is, co is competent. We call these fraction skeptics. So we will assume <coughs> we will assume that the fraction of um, that the prayer of people who think highly of the dictator is still less than one, one half. This means, given our assumptions, that if there is no information, is no information, if there is no persuasion, no propaganda, then citizens are not supporting the dictator. They will make a choice, but if they do not believe that um, uh, the competence of the leader is higher than one half, then they um, do not support the dictator. So the persuasion takes the following, um, the following form. The leader, the sender, commits to an information strategy which translates the state of the world into the signal to the population. So the leader himself doesn't know the signal. He first chooses the information structure, then, um, then the information structure translates the signals. So the standard interpretation of this assumption of this uh, assumption is that the leaders in authoritarian regimes, they do, not, um, they do not edit the news in the real time. What they do is that they put in some censorship standards, they put in some institutions, they appoint editors, they appoint managers of the censorship structure, then news arrives, then this existing institution produces a signal, right? So there is a kind of, important substantive reason to use the Bayesian persuasion, to use the Bayesian persuasion model to model authoritarian propaganda. But of course, but of course, it's an important assumption that the leader commits to an information strategy rather than first learns the state of the world and then tries to persuade. Like in, the, in this simple setup, the leader wouldn't be able to persuade anyone if there were no uh, commitment power, if there would be no this institutional setup. So we assume, we assume for now that the leader uses public persuasion, meaning that the leader produces one institution that produces news for the whole population. As we shall see, this is an important assumption, but this is well justified. After, after we finish the main part, I will show you that actually this is about loss of generality, even if the, uh, if the leader would have been able to target individual groups, then he wouldn't have been able to do better than uh, just using public persuasion. Okay, so now it's sort of a standard standard analysis uh, analysis of persuasion. Now, if we express the leader's payoff in the posterior of the leader, we assume for simplicity, that's just an assumption for simplicity, that the leader has the same prayer about uh, his own competence as the uh, people who are more likely to support him. So he's not skeptical about his own competence. Of course, I don't know how, um, uh, whether people in economic theory uh, know this, but of course, like in applied, in applied theory, when we talk about authoritarian regimes, when we talk about leaders' competence, we do not we do not mean that this is a something like a trait which exists for the duration of his tenure. We assume that uh, that competence is something which is relevant to the current moment. For example, there is a war, and then this is the first war uh, that citizens um, that citizens encounter during this dictator's tenure. So they do not know whether he's competent or incompetent to manage this war or the natural disaster or other kind of problems. So it, then it becomes natural that the leader actually doesn't know his own competence, uh, co competence himself, right? So this, you could think about this competence as a parameter, something that is not about a person, but something about a match of the person to the environment or to the current mm -hmm. challenge. And then it's quite natural that uh, the leader himself doesn't know the prayer. Okay, now we assume, we need to assume that 
the leader has a prior. So the leader has the same the same prior as those who um, regard regard him well. Uh, so now we could exp express her the leader's payoff as a function of the posterior. So we establish an information structure. It produces a signal. There is a message. Uh, there is a posterior, right? So suppose that um, people with high prior, they have posterior mu. Then we could calculate using the bias formula, um, the skeptics posterior about, um, about, the, uh, about the leader's competence. We could calculate it a straightforward calculation. It was derived in a paper by Alonso and Kamara. This is the first, the first formula derived in this, in this uh, paper. So it's it's on the screen. The important thing is that if the skeptics are convinced, so if the skeptics posterior is larger than one half, then the leader's posterior must be larger than one half, right? So we produce, Colin. Yeah, question. Sorry, can I ask you a quick question about the payoff function? Sure. Um, I'm wondering if one way of interpreting that is that the leader has career concerns and and the mu is a sufficient statistic for both mu and mu prime. And so V of mu encodes the probability that the leader is going to stay in power. Uh, okay. I mean, we, we do not model explicitly what happens with the leader if the support is low. Presumably, this yeah. is something bad that happens that happens yeah. to the leader. So, like in our model, the leader just uh, maximizes yeah. maximizes her support, right? So her payoff is in terms of people who will eventually uh, choose the high level of support, right? Who's, yes. Yes, but that, that mu can also inc include the mu prime, given that mu prime is a deterministic function of mu. So, so this can be interpreted, depending on your choice of the V function, this can be interpreted as, as a probability of remaining in power or something like that. Right. Okay, right. yep, yep. In a sense, in a sense, uh, yeah, okay. the payoff depends on mu because mu is a function and actually a summary statistics about the institution, like about okay. the choice of the about the choice of the signal. So, like this is basically like unpacking what does it mean uh, to have mu. So, if people who are dictators, potential supporters, have posterior mu, then skeptics have uh, posterior mu. Um, no prime, right? And this posterior is lower than no, which means that if these skeptics are persuaded, then those who are more supportive, they're sort of over persuaded, hmm. right? Constantine, I have a very quick question on this information strategy. I mean, most of the stuff we see generally, and we've seen even before, I mean, since the 50s, it, there's two strategies and, and leaders usually take different approaches, either by saying I'm the best, and having to convince, or by saying all the others are worse. So I'm the best you got. In a sense, the target is not only about a, a prior on, on, on himself, herself, but it's very much conditioned on, on the context. We see this in the information strategy today. It's not necessarily that Putin is the best, but everything else, the alternative is so much worse. So, so in a sense, it almost seems that the information strategy depends a little bit on the context or, or there, there almost, there seems to be different strategies of how to persuade people. Okay, I, I would say that we abstract away from this. This is certainly an important consideration and there are interesting empirical, empirical work about this, how the governments, uh, for example, how the dictators, uh, they create uh, like, they create sort of reference points, for example, um, even in peace times, most of the news about abroad on Russian TV or on Belarusian TV is basically how bad bad things are yes. there. Because right? they anchor and adjust. This is basically creating a reference point in which the uh, mm -hmm. our leader looks um, looks competent relative to what is going on there. That's correct, but we do not 
I mean, our model is too parsimonious to. Okay, uh, okay, thanks. Okay, so now, so now, basically, uh, that's what I've already what I've already explained. So, if we have convinced skeptics that the probability that the leader is competent, so there is a reason to support the leader, then this means that others, the non-skeptics, they're actually more than sufficiently convinced, right? And then the value function, as Colin uh, correctly anticipated, is a function of mu. If mu is uh, between zero and one half, then no one is persuaded. If v of mu is between one half and a certain threshold, which is, uh, which is up on the screen, then only non-skeptics are persuaded. Finally, if mu is high enough, then everyone is persuaded. Okay, so uh, the leader's value as a function of the posterior. And we could see the two different cases. We see the situation in which there are a lot of skeptics, and we see a situation in which there are only few skeptics. And the thing is that, in I mean, you do not need to read much from these pictures, but basically the message is that there are many skeptics, then you need to take them, them into account. And the optimal strategy, the optimal strategy is to persuade them. And if there is the amount of skeptics is low, then the optimal strategy is to ignore them, right? There is a general result uh, by Kaminitsa and Genskov in their 2011 paper on Bayesian persuasion that the best thing that persuader could do, that the sender could do in these circumstances is to achieve the expected payoff on the concave closure of the, of the value function of the sender. So the concave closure in these two cases, the high amount of skeptics and low amount of skeptics looks differently. So basically the message of this picture is that you need to address different, um, you need to choose different strategy. If there are a lot of skeptics, you persuade them and the others are over persuaded. If there is a um, small amount, of, small number of skeptics, the share of skeptics is small, then you ignore them, and then you do the minimum uh, persuasion for the uh, for the non-skeptics. Okay. So uh, one one simple result again. It follows from a general theorem in Kaminitsa and Genskov. It also a straightforward exercise. You could calculate, you could prove it directly that the optimal policy, the optimal propaganda policy in this case contains two messages, zero or one. And under the optimal policy, if the real, if the real state of the world is that the leader is competent, then the institution reports that the leader is indeed competent. But, but if the leader is incompetent, so the state of the world is zero, then it makes sense with some uh, probability to report that the leader is competent, right? So this is, uh, this is already well known, and this is extremely natural. So basically, if you're in an authoritarian regime and you produce a media which always lie, then nobody is going to read this media because there is no interest in reading this media. There is no gain from reading this media. If you have a media that uh, always tell the truth, then uh, there is no propaganda value in this media. You do not persuade people. So basically the optimal propaganda media is a media that tells the truth part of the time and add propaganda reports non-truth a part of the time, but still this part of non-truth doesn't happen too often, otherwise people would not, uh, would not believe this media. So that is the optimal level of propaganda. And in this case, in this model, when there are two different groups of the population, the optimal level is either the one which is optimal for the non-skeptics, if the number of skeptics is uh, low, so they're ignored, or 
it's the level which is optimal for skeptics. And then in this case, the non-skeptics are uh, overpersuaded. Okay, now this is- can I just, yeah. You're modeling this as a one-shot game. Yeah. So when, when you talk about learning not to trust the propaganda, that's all that's all reduced form. Right. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. that's Thank true. You. But I, I, need, I need to say that, uh, that when I say that this mechanism is optimal, then if there is like one action and there is um, all kind of information uh, back and forth between the initial, the initial situation and the final action, then this mechanism is optimal among all possible mechanisms. So whatever is the communication protocol, be it Crawford, Sobel, Milgram, Roberts, whatever, like whatever is the number of stages of information exchange, anything, this still, this still is the optimal from the sender perspective. So it's, it does the maximum persuasion. This is one, uh, one theoretical advantage of Bayesian persuasion that this is the theoretically, the mechanism that produces the largest uh, the largest amount of persuasion. You could prove formally, and it's in the appendix of community and against group paper, that um, you cannot do more. Whatever is, even if you engage in some information exchange, if you release information uh, sequentially, you cannot do more than, uh, than this mechanism, than these circumstances. Okay, now let, let's add repression. So before the leader engages in propaganda, she has a chance to do repressions. Basically, the leader observes an informative label of receiver's prayers. So it's informative, meaning that you are labeled skeptic. Uh, this means that there is at least probability one half that you are skeptic. It's not, it's not misleading. This is without loss of gener generality, because if it would be like, informative in the sense that um, if you're labeled skeptic, you're more likely to be non-skeptic than just relabel, just rename the labels and you will have uh, this situation. So then now that everyone has a label and you could think of the probability that the label is correct uh, raw as, I don't know, the quality of the secret police or the uh, parameter of ethic villages if uh, if the if the conflict is over ethnicity or something but this is basically uh, a parameter that reflects the dictator's quality of information about whether the person is skeptical about his competence her competence or not okay so then the dictator chooses how or much people to repress repress basically the share of people in each group, group meaning label, not meaning the true identity because the labels is what the dictator observes. And then there is a cost associated with repressions because basically we assume that repressing is costly. It's costly in terms of the foregone output, foregone um, potential soldiers, everything. So when the repressed citizens are purged, the Remaining share is what matters for the dictator. So the dictator cares about the support among the remaining remaining share and the cost of repressions. Okay, now the key mechanism here is that repression, according to the labels, when it's the optimal choice by the dictator, changes the distribution of opinions. Colin, are you raising your hand? I think that was what I was about to ask. So, so the repression does two things. It takes people out of the distribution in the first place. And so it changes the V of mu, but then it also changes the distribution of opinions. Okay, like here, the leader is not constrained in the choice. I mean, the leader cares about the cost of repression, but the leader could choose any, any share of skeptics and non-skeptics to be repressed, yep. right? So, Exante, it might not change the distribution of opinions, right? If you choose the same share of both. 
Oh, I see. I see. But, but it's not that it's not that arresting Navalny causes other citizens to change their views. It's no. just that it takes him out of the population. But if you decided to arrest Navalny supporters, then the share of Navalny support in the remaining okay. group of the population becomes lower. Okay. Right. OK, so there isn't a demonstration effect. It isn't that I decide to to stay quiet as a result of other people being oppressed. No, okay. understood. I, I, of course, there is a demonstration effect. I think it will be much harder or much more harder to model the demonstration effect. But I agree with you that it, potentially a better model would, uh, would incorporate the demonstration effect of, of repress, repressions. And obviously, it, then repressions could backfire. Actually, there are models in which repressions, uh, repressions backfire. Konstantin, I have a very quick question here. So um, you mentioned optimality before in terms of information manipulation. Um, um, once we bring repression in, in, isn't this a little bit, in a sense, a, a matrix of two by two where the dictator chooses cost, which is total cost, meaning the part related to manipulation and the part related to repression, and then maximizes payoff based on the share of these two costs. Because generally repression comes with its own manipulation and manipulation comes with its own repression. Why would you, why would you think that repression comes with its own manipulation? Because, well, for example, you know, just what Colin said before, uh, you arrest Navalny, but you have to engage in information manipulation and say, something bad about Navalny or something fake about Navalny or whatever. So you're trying to tell them, no, he's not right. He's a foreign agent, whatever, whatever was said. Right. I, so, I would say that what you, what you just told me, it sort of relies on people being fooled about this. Right. So our model, our model of persuasion, our model of repression is a model with rational actors. And that's, I think, an important feature of propaganda. I mean, when I was a kid in the Soviet Union, I knew that the newspapers are heavily censored. I was not fooled, fooled about that, right? So basically, yeah. you're right that in our model, people do distinguish, like they do distinguish the information manipulation mechanism and the repression mechanism. Understood. Okay, then let me ask differently. If you think of it as a sequential game, does it make sense optimally to manipulate a T, manipulate a T plus one, then the marginal benefits of manipulation start to decrease and then you introduce repression and then you go back to, to, to information manipulation at T plus four, for example, because they tend to alternate in a sense. I don't know if, you know, if, if this is part of, maybe it's completely out there, but, but I feel like these two elements are, are integrated. Okay, in our, in our model, the attitude of uh, anyone, it, I mean, the prior, it doesn't change because of the people are repressed. So the only thing that changes is that when you acquire new information, okay. your, um, your uh, expectations change. You have mm -hmm. a posterior instead of a prior. Okay. Right? So it sort of does not matter whether you do this sequentially or not. Understood, understood, thanks. Uh, so I have a question, Constantine. I don't sure. know if, could you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so if I understand correctly, you know, part of the discussion that just happened, uh, then when I am repressing, right, I'm basically taking a chunk of the population out and I'm changing the distribution of who's remaining, right? Right. And of course, if there are no costs to repression, then I could just repress my way to a majority because the repression is not affecting the beliefs of the people who are supporters. Is that correct? All right. Yeah. So when you talk about you know, these uh, um, strategies being complements, I'm assuming there has to be some cost going on. So maybe I just missed it. Um, is, is that, because uh, if there are no costs, like, okay, I could just repress my way to majority. I don't no. need the persuasion. There is a cost, there is a cost of repression. Okay, then I, I okay. No, and, and... Uh, th there is just, just a cost. It's a linear cost in terms of the share of people being repressed. That's perhaps the simplest possible assumption. Okay. 
And are the, cause, cause what I'm, what I was thinking about where the complementarity intuitively would come from is that uh, the costs of the, I could repress, you know, I could persuade. Um, and the more I repress, I would expect that the kind of, you know, marginal cost of persuasion relative to the marginal cost of X repression should be lower. Is that what's going on here? I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the intuition. Uh, I think what you said is sort of uh, is sort of correct in a in a sense, right? So basically, like uh, when the share of skeptics is low, right? Like the mm -hmm. optimal thing is to ignore them. So if you first repress to the situation in which the share of skeptics is low, then you. Um, uh, you, you, you ignore them in persuasion. And in a sense, this is, then the persuasion has lower cost, lower cost for you. Okay. It, you, it seems, I mean, it seems like a... Pers persuade the remaining people more. Right. So, so it seems like to, to drive a, a simple example of the complementarity story, it would be nice to see an example where if I'm only allowed to persuade, I'm not going to get my way. If I'm only allowed to repress, I'm not going to get my way. But if you let me use both of them, I will actually be able to get my way. Does that sound like a reasonable way to try to show this? Uh, all right. In, in a, in a sense, <laughs> like the thing is that he, he, I, I, the historical examples, they typically could be could be interpreted alongside so many dimensions that there is always something that is interpretable in the way in the way you want. So I, I, I would I would think I would I would think that uh, what's going on uh, what's going on now, like since two thousand nineteen in Russia and since two thousand August two thousand twenty in Belarus, it sort of confirms confirms our results because for. Uh, for years, actually, for decades, this, these regimes, they were um, spending an enormous amount of money on information manipulation, but they were relatively uh, not very repressive. So the number of arrests per year were at low hundreds each year, which is, which is small for the regimes with such a low political accountability. This was a low level of repression, but when situations got, situation got worse, it stopped, it basically stopped working. So like in August 20, uh, 2020 in Belarus, uh, whatever, like the full control over the, all the information sources was not, was not sufficient. And they, uh, just to keep Lukashenko in power, they had to arrest now thousands of people, put in jail hundreds, uh, hundreds of people uh, giving them uh, long terms pushing out of the country tens of thousands of people. So I would say, yes, you see this, that uh, information manipulation worked, and then at some point it stopped working unless there is uh, a real uh, repression, meaning purging people. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay. So now the general formula, if uh, the leader chooses the, uh, the following repression strategy, chooses two parameters, what share of people labeled skeptics and people labeled non-skeptics should be purged, then the expected remaining share of skeptics is given by this formula. We could calculate the leader's, the leader's payoff as a function of the share of skeptics. Then, then we prove a straightforward dilemma someone could say that this is this is obvious we still uh, we still prove it is that it never makes sense to repress uh, those who are most most supportive so we have only two types of the people but if we have if we would have had more types a distribution of types the result will be still true it does not make sense to uh, repress those who have the highest uh, the highest priors, right? They will be um, whatever information structure you choose, 
whatever propaganda apparatus is constructed, uh, they will be the most, uh, they will have the highest posterior after information manipulation. So if you would have not persuaded them, then everyone else wouldn't been persuaded. So it doesn't, it never makes sense to, uh, never makes sense to repress these people. Okay, then about skeptics, given our extremely simple assumption about the cost of repression, that this is just a linear function of the share of, um, of skeptics, is that is the proposition is that there is a threshold such that if uh, the cost of repressions is lower than this, this threshold, you basically repress everyone who is labeled skeptics. Not every skeptic, but everyone who is labeled skeptic. And if uh, the cost is high enough, then you do not repress skeptic, skeptics, right? Then we would put all of our results about information manipulation and repression together. It will be is that if the number of skeptics is high and the cost of repressions is low, then you repress the skeptics and do the maximum propaganda on the rest. If uh, the number of skeptics is low, then you just ignore them. Then you do not need to, uh, to do the repression. So here, this is basically the complementarity, the complementarity that Steve already, already discussed. If the cost of repression is low and the number of skeptics is high, then it's optimal not to ignore them. You repress and then, and then you, you cannot, then you cannot ignore them unless you repress, uh, you repress them. You cannot, meaning that it's not optimal. So you repress them and then you could persuade others more. You will send them more skewed, skewed information. And this is a kind of the mechanism that makes repression and uh, propaganda complementary. If you repress the most skeptical part of the population, then others could be fed more um, less inform more um, persuasive information, right? The signal will be tilted uh, more against them. Then the sender will be able to extract all the surplus. Because if the sender, if the leader deals with all groups of populations, there is no repression, then it might have need to tailor uh, her message to the skeptics. So skeptics are persuaded. Then the others are over, they're under persuaded in the sense that if they would have been alone, they would have been persuaded more. They would have produced support more often, more, um, more support and expectation. But if you could eliminate skeptics, then you persuade others, uh, others more. So we think that this is what is going on in Russia and Belarus. This is what, what is going on in George Orwell, 1984, because a lot of people read 1984 as about, as about propaganda and changing minds and all these things. But actually what this story tells us is that all this propaganda and, you know, they have this, um, there is a big description how they change the language, how they have the radio stations that cannot be switched off, how they have obligatory meetings in which they're indoctrinated and they're hatred against, uh, against foreign enemies and their position and national traitors. But this all, like the uh, propaganda machine, would not work as Orwell, um, Orwell uh, demonstrates if it was not for just brutal repressions, everyone is tortured. And unless they are tortured in the most horrible ways, then they are actually not persuaded, although they exposed to this whole information machine. And once um, uh, the most skeptical people, the protagonists of the Orwell's novel uh, are repressed, then persuasion works. Okay. This is 
uh, not the end of my story because I wanted to discuss one assumption that I made casually when going into this um, when to, into this result, and this actually has a kind of a substantive. Um, it, it was a kind of a substantive assumption. So one thing that we assumed uh, in this model that the only mechanism that is available for the dictator is uh, public persuasion. So that is this like countrywide censorship strategy, or that is like a system of laws that that um, defines how the information system operates. So that is one chief minister of propaganda on, on, on something. But suppose, suppose uh, that each citizen can follow only one media, media source. So for some reason, the dictator could tailor a message to individual citizens. This is in economic theory, it's called private, private persuasion. The thing is that of course, of course, if there are two different media sources, then each citizens would want to follow both, both media sources, our citizens are rational, there are no, um, no cost of following the media source. But then again, if everyone follows both media, we are in the realm of public persuasion, that's the, exactly the case that we discussed earlier. So assume that it's possible, I don't know, for cognitive, um, some cognitive conditions, people cannot follow more than one media source or the dictator is able to reach people, people individually and they do not watch other media. Suppose that we discuss the situation of private persuasion and then we will call a private persuasion mechanism a pair of information structures which depends not only on the state of the world, the signal depends not only on the state of the world, but also on the uh, type of a citizens, citizen who receive it. Since we have only two types of citizens, of course, now our, our private persuasion mechanism need to, needs to be a pair of information, uh, information structures. We do not need more than uh, two. Then we could calculate the expected pair of a citizen, right? So it's just straightforward exercise. And then we say that private persuasion mechanism, mechanism is incentive compatible if each citizen has incentives to follow the source that targeted to her. So we had two types of citizens with high priors and with low priors, the skeptics. We have two, uh, two media, one which sends signals to skeptics, one which sends signals to media. And we require that these mechanisms uh, be incentive compatible in the sense that the skeptics follow the skeptics media and the non-skeptics follow the non-skeptics media, right? Again, if there were no costs and restrictions of following uh, both media, then of course each citizen would follow uh, both media. They will get as much information as uh, they want. And this will be exactly the case that we've already analyzed. In this case, that's what we, we discussed before. Now suppose that there are different media for different types of people and these mechanisms are incentive compatible. Then uh, we could prove the following result that for any incentive compatible persuasion mechanism, there exists another persuasion mechanism which is public and this public persuasion mechanism does more persuasion than the private persuasion mechanism. Or you could formulate it simpler. It does not make sense for the sender to use a private persuasion mechanism. Of course, like the main intuition here is that the incentive compatibility constraint, it, it, it's a big constraint, right? It, uh, it puts a lot of, it, it puts a lot of restriction on, on, on what could be used for private persuasion. So private persuasion in this basic environment does not have uh, any bite, which means this theorem uh, justifies our assumption that it is sufficient to focus only on public persuasion. It doesn't make sense to consider, consider private persuasion. 
this result is uh, our result is new for our environment, but uh, it's not new in general because a paper by uh, Anton Kalatilin, uh, Timofey Milovanov, the president of the Kiev School of Economics, and I think Kalatilin Zapishinuk and Nin Klee, they prove this the impossibility of private persuasion result in a different setup, which is more general and much more interest, much more interesting theoretically. The result is in a setup with uh, agents with heterogeneous preferences, which is different from our setup uh, in which uh, agents uh, have the same preferences, but do have uh, heterogeneous priors. So of course, so basically our result, it's not that big economic theory, but it, it provides kind of a good explanation why it makes sense to focus on public persuasion uh, results in our uh, in our main setup. Okay, so um, what was in this paper is a theoretical model which demonstrates that propaganda is a complement to repression. The idea is that when there are many skeptics in the society, then a change in the cost of repression, if we have a society, then, for example, the cost of repression has fallen relative to, I don't know, other costs because there is a war or because it became more important for the dictator, then you could expect both high repression. And if this repression is like really targeted and most of the repressions throughout human history, it's well documented, they are targeted. So there are labels and these labels are high, high, highly correlated with the regime skeptics then we will see both high repression and high propaganda. Another theoretical result in our paper is that there is no private persuasion mechanism that is better than a public one. So it makes sense when we talk about the complementarity of propaganda and repression to focus on public persuasion mechanisms. Okay, that's it. Many thanks. Uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, interesting insights, and I think there's so many questions. Um, um, it, are there any comments, any further questions from the audience? Uh, just uh, keep in mind that we, we take some uh, questions on, on the recorded session, and then once we turn off recording, you can ask, you know, hopefully, Constantine, hope you can stick around and ask, uh, answer some other questions, maybe. On, on, sure. uh, on to, to read questions in the chat. No, I think we're fine. Those have been um, those have been addressed, um, right, Colin? Yeah, yeah. So uh, otherwise, if there's any other comments or, or questions, uh, yeah, please just unmute yourselves and jump in if you've got questions. Um. So then perhaps, Colin, shall we just uh, turn off recording and we can just, you know. Yeah, let, let me ask, can I ask a quick question, Kostya? Yeah, sure. um, so, suppose, suppose we wanted to take this to data somehow. I mean, what, what would be, I mean, what would be a good case? I mean, have you, have you tried doing that? Is, is that? is that something of interest? Um, I mean, the story, the story makes perfect sense um, that you tell. And, and so I guess I would just like to see, like to see what happens. Um, you know, if you look at number of arrests, do we have good data on number of arrests in Russia, for example? Uh, okay, we have good data on the on the number of arrests. We have data on jail jail times. Actually, it's information manipulation, which is more difficult to to the to beta. Oh, But I, I think it, to make an empirical statement that there is both massive increase in propaganda accompanied by a massive increase in political repressions over three years, there is like overwhelming evidence of this. Like there are more arrests in any major city, there is more money spent on information manipulation. Um, that's the, the same thing in, in, in Belarus. I mean, the. Mm. There is there is data on how many people are arrested. There is data on jail terms. Actually, I have these these uh, these data over the last three two years in 
in Belarus, the number of arrests increased like tenfold, mm -hmm. one hundredfold. So they had hundreds of arrests per year, and they have 35,000 of arrests during 2020, 2021. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ask partly because I guess, I mean, so this, this is a, a first cut at the theory. And, and I guess one way of trying to evolve the theory is to see which of the stylized facts it fits better and, than others. Is there any number of suggestions about how to, how to evolve the theory? And so the question is, which are the ones that are going to have the highest payoff? I don't know. I actually, actually, typically, I have more stylized facts in my talks, but I decided not to use it here because it's sort of unfocused attention. I mean, okay. that's. I mean, I actually in, initially I prepared slides on uh, uh, information about arrests in the occupied territories in Ukraine and on uh, these moving TV screens which the Russian authorities brought into Mariupol. So Mariupol is mostly mostly destroyed. There is no running water. There is no, no food for 100,000 people living there. But the Russian government moved um, huge TV screens uh, there because apparently they think that this is the mo most important thing that need to be done in, in the ruins of the city. Thank you. I will stop recording now and stop live streaming. Um, but Kostya, if you could stick around for a bit longer for an informal discussion, that would be great. And I invite anyone um, here as well. I'm, I'm glad to see so many of you out. So this is your chance to, to, to fire all the questions you have at Kostya. Thank you very much again for speaking. Sure. Let's thank you for, for doing this.